Hello and welcome to Cracking the Cryptic, the world's number one Sudoku podcast hosted by the two men behind the world's number one Sudoku YouTube channel, Cracking the Cryptic. I'm Peter C. Hayward. I'm Simon Anthony. And I'm Mark Goodliff. Today, we thought we would end the first season with a bunch of listener submitted questions. So are you two ready to answer all of, you know, plumb the depths of your soul and answer the questions that people have been dying to ask you forever and ever? I'm going to reserve a couple of vetoes to just not answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this could be interesting. <laughs> so far, we've talked about you cheating on your wife, your wife hating Sodoku, but you're like, no, I still got to gotta keep, keep some vetoes in here just for the really personal stuff. <laughs> so the first question, this one came in via email, and I was really interested to hear the answer myself. Um, it says, hi, Mark and Simon. How are you? Very good, thank you. Uh, I'm about a 5 out of 10. <laughs> well, this is quite an interesting question for me, actually, because I'm actually on <laughs> doing an interview tomorrow with a guy who majors on mental wellness. And he is he's just done a TED Talk on the importance of the question, how are you doing today? And he encourages people to, in response to that question, give a real answer rather Ooh. than a sort of platitude answer. Rather than a mark answer. Yeah, and like a real answer being a sort of score out of 10. <laughs> Mark's got his head in his hands. He doesn't want to do this, yeah, clearly. Like... And uh, yeah, so anyway, I'm doing that tomorrow. So how am I doing today? I'd be a five out of 10, I think, something like that. Five out of 10 is relatively low. What, what would be a, what would a 10 out of 10 look like for you? I never, don't think I've ever had a 10 <laughs> out of 10 day. I mean, I don't think I might not have had a six out of 10 day, basically, yeah. Simon is an extraordinary <laughs> hypochondriac who believes that, you know, a, a slight headache is a potential tumour. Yeah. I would not have guessed that. So hang on. So you've never gotten to like a six out of 10. You've never gotten lower than a four out of 10. So is every day a five out of 10? Uh, no, no, I have, no, have bad days, oh, but very rarely above average days so the the best day of your life is a five out of ten no the best day would probably have been higher than that but it's very rare for me to have an <laughs> above average day always something will ruin it <laughs> yeah you, you've gone the you've gone the full loop it's gone from like no really think about it and then give a generic answer <laughs> i think you've somehow turned the genuine answer into a total platitude yeah. brilliant sorry out of 10 mark how are you let's let, let's experiment with this new system there is that doesn't mean anything to me as a question <laughs> really yeah i'm always the same today is one of those days <laughs> amazing someone asked and this actually ties to what we were talking about right before we started recording someone asked uh, do mark and simon have any favorite panel shows they enjoy watching and before you answer uh panel shows are actually a very british thing i don't know if you guys realize this but america doesn't do panel shows which i think is is horrible because they're one of my absolute favorite forms of entertainment so uh, mark do you want to explain for the non-uk listeners what a panel show is yeah the the way that panel shows have fallen now in the uk is that there's two or three comedians to each of two sides answering questions on well it can range from sort of general knowledge to just literally anything so uh, there are some intriguing formats one of the most famous ones is never mind the buzzcocks qi is a classic yeah that, that's yeah. another one yeah so qi is about everything buzzcocks is about specifically music so the the shows can go general or specific yes that's very good buzzcocks about music there's a question of sport has been running for 50 years and is about sport it's that kind of stuff but uh i guess my my two favorites would be a show called would I Lie to You, and a second one, and QI. Amazing shows. Mm, I go, uh, Have I Got News For You would be one of mine, and probably a uh, league of their own. What's, I've not heard of that one. Is that sports? Uh, it's very, yeah, it's very funny. Yeah, it's a sports <laughs> yeah. and comedy show. I would warmly approve yeah. both choices there as well. Would I Lie to You is probably my number one recommendation if you're trying to get to panel shows. It changed my life genuinely when I first saw that show. Wow. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to my favorite clip of all time from that show. But I, I saw that in 2012, 2013, and then spent the rest the next two and a half years of my life running live panel shows. <laughs> Uh, I got I got super into them. I just I, I love them. Will, will there ever be a Sudoku panel show? Do you think? Do you think the hobby will expand that far? <laughs> I don't know quite how it would work uh, in terms of format. Someone asked, uh, actually related to panel shows. Um, out of the two of you, who would do better on Countdown? Well, we could we could. Well, Simon would because I've given it a go and didn't win my episode. You are on Countdown? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I came up against a series winner who uh, has rubbed salt into the wounds by apologising for beating me as his eighth victory and um, becoming a fan of cracking the cryptic for a while. <laughs> 
<laughs> Countdown again for those not in the UK uh, is a show where they're given two tasks basically. One is they get given a string of numbers and a result, and they have to use mathematical operators to turn those numbers into the result. And the other one is sort of a wheel of fortune thing where they're given a string of letters and they have to find the longest word within those letters. Is that an apt description? Yeah, that's pretty good. Countdown aficionados would be very impressed. Yeah by the fact that I built up a 26 point lead against a seven time winner. And uh, anybody would be very unimpressed by the fact that I then lost that lead. When, when were you on? When, what, what year was all this? Oh, it was, um, yes, about 10 years ago, maybe a little longer now. Is it online? You can, you can find it, you can find it online, yeah. Oh, there's, yeah. A, there's a little clip of the final game, yeah. the, 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 the one that's slightly different from the ones you describe, a nine letter anagram conundrum, which had I, had I got that first, um, I would have won the show, but my opponent get, got it in one second. Wow! Didn't really give me much of a chance. Yeah. So, I, so I don't, I don't know if I would do better than Mark, but I do know that neither of us would hold a candle to Sam Kappelman Lines, who is, of course, fairly famous in Sudoku circles. Um, and Sam got to the season final in well two seasons ago and was absolutely startlingly good and you know we can say that as people who do so many crosswords we ought to have an immense vocabulary we could draw on for the letters rounds of countdown but some of the words that Sam came up with were <laughs> quite quite extraordinary and very impressive indeed so and to put it yeah. in context to get to the final you have to be one of the two best out of about 150 people in each series, so it's pretty impressive. Were you, were you in the final? No, no, I got because you know, the the format works such that if you don't beat the oh, head head. reigning champion, you just go home. So I did one show. Gotcha. Have you ever applied? Uh, Lost uh, by five points and went home or something. <laughs> uh, Simon, have you ever applied to to go on countdown? No, I would be terrified. It's like things like Mastermind. In fact, it's a very strange thing, given what I now do for a living. You know, the fear of public ridicule is strong in me it does seem to haunt you <laughs> yeah, this, this comes up a lot and yeah i expose myself to it every day <laughs> but i i think i feel at the moment i have some degree of control over it because you know if i muff up a puzzle i can just turn off the video and like no one sees it so that's fine but it's not really fine but it it, it avoids the uh, it avoids all the ridicule that could come my way. I find that intriguing. So, yeah. I'm absolutely certain I thrive under the pressure, including the pressure of just being recording myself solving Sudoku. I mean, my best example of this is I, I also appeared on University Challenge, another panel show. You may remember many years ago, Simon thinks I bring this up at every opportunity and I'm proving I do. He makes me watch it every time I go round there and then he sits there and shouts out the answers. He shouts out the answers. It's like you've, you've watched this 300 times before. I know you know the answers. But the show at first aired about six months after I'd filmed it and I was watching it and they asked a question. I thought nobody would know the answer to that. And then I watched myself answer it. And I was very confused. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Have you two done any other TV appearances uh, other than Countdown and? No, that's it. Yeah, Mark. Mark. Mark's been in Bridget. He's been in uh, a movie. He's been in Bridget Jones's Diary. I'm in. I'm in that film for two seconds as an extra. <laughs> thrilling <laughs> can we put a challenge out to the listeners to like round up all of these uh media appearances that you two did because I, I would love to see them <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's i don't think there are none for me so <laughs> but mark has got some good ones was, was being an extra th a thing you did regularly no no not at all i just found out this was shooting that evening and went down to have a look and because i was dressed differently from all the other extras because i was wearing my work suit uh the director of extras decided that I must be an extra and asked me to do something. <laughs> did, he, did he look at you with an American accent and say, you, you, you got star power, kid? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I deliberately stood near where the extras were in the hope that this would happen, but I didn't expect it to happen at all. <laughs> any, any... I was effectively an unpaid extra. Oh, lovely. <laughs> I, I used to do extra work uh, for a living, but it was all Australian stuff. So uh, my, my mum would go and watch whatever I was in and, and try to find me in the background, but no one else ever saw it. What was the biggest thing you were in, Peter? What would we know? Oh, for you guys, probably Neighbours, actually. Um, oh, wow. Brilliant. How many episodes? Uh, probably four or five. Again, just like a, a, a blink and you'd miss an extra. So Neighbours is a very big deal in the UK. In Australia, it's not at all. In Australia, it's just like, yeah, we make a show and for some reason they like it in Britain. And so when you're doing extra work, it's like, okay, do you want to do something exciting or do you want to be on Neighbours again? And I was always like, oh, I'll do, I'll do Neighbours again, that's fine. I, I put together a little um, a montage of my appearances. So it's just me like walking past the camera and then 
two scenes later walking past the camera <laughs> this is before the blue beard uh so i'm, I'm a little less easy to spot <laughs> gosh that brings back memories for me because when i was at university my entire university life was basically uh well it revolved around neighbors and home and away i had to i had to be in my room to watch both of those things there was no video recording at that time <laughs> You know, and I was so addicted, especially to Home and Away, that I really, I just couldn't miss it. I'm afraid I've never seen either of the shows, Peter. I'm sorry. <laughs> a st- a stunned silence. It's <laughs> the thing about this podcast. The, the, the reason I wanted to do it is just to like, you know, engage with you guys in a way other than Sudoku. And it has been an absolute journey of like, because <laughs> you, you you give across this certain persona, each of you on the show, on, on the on Crack and Crypto, <laughs> you give across this certain persona, and then we come in and chat, and it just blows that persona out of the water it's it's ridiculous i'll also tell you that at university in my in my final year i reckon i was conservatively playing four hours of pinball every day (laughs) did you quit because you were only third best in the world very good i i reckon at that time i was actually quite good at pinball and i used to absolutely love it and i could make a pound last for you know hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and it was i just just loved it and it was because i was really stressed about my exams because i've done no work because i was playing golf all the time you know i rather than actually do work i just played pinball because that would allow me to forget about the fact that i wasn't doing any work (laughs) (laughs) do do you own a pinball machine now i do yes did you have a favorite uh yes i do definitely star trek the next generation I also enjoy the Adams family. I mean, the pinball now, pinball collection is uh, is quite a big thing. It's a very you have to pay a lot of money for a very good pinball machine nowadays. <laughs> I've actually helped fail to carry Simon's pinball machine down the stairs. Yeah, that is it is a pinball machine weighs a lot of you know. I realise that. Oh yeah, they're, they're huge. Yeah, they they weigh a lot. So, which one do you own, Star Trek? Star Trek, yeah. It's a magnificent thing. It really is. I was probably in my in my twenties before I learned that pinball machines have a plot. Like I, I had no idea that they had like levels oh, and yeah. you could advance through the levels. I thought it was just you know hit, hitting buttons and trying to stop it from going to the bottom. But like there's specific like uh, I'm, I'm going to game design mode now. Like there's there's short term goals and long term goals and combos and all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's mag- and the, well, Star Trek: Next Generation is in- incredible. You know, you've got to get to the final frontier, and to do that, you have to have <laughs> you have to have control of your pinball. Let me tell you, it's all news to me. <laughs> you got to get to the final frontier. Yes, which involves you know. So there's sort of uh, I think there's about eight missions that you have to do. Um, so you've got to keep your. What is the final? Yeah. Hang on, because the, the, the whole the whole quote is that space is the final frontier. <laughs> Yeah, but if you get to the final frontier, you get basically an unlimited multi-ball, which is, I don't know, that's... No, 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 that's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking mechanically, oh. I'm talking thematically here. Like, what, what, so is the whole game on Earth until you hit the final frontier? What's, what's the... No, no, it's in space. Final, the final frontier, I think, is somewhere in space in the Star Trek space, universe. Space is the final... <laughs> no, I think, I think, well... <laughs> You're just going off the quote. I don't think. I, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm yeah. misunderstanding. I, I thought that you know the 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 frontier of, of the old west was you know trying to you know explore the old west and. and... Oh, you, I see. So you're worried the pinball machine is just all on Earth, and then you finally get to space if, if you sort of master it. Yeah, because <laughs> the, the the quote is space. Uh, the final frontier like you know we, we've explored everything we can on earth and now we're entering the final frontier which is space and they've clearly maybe i've misinterpreted but it sounds like the pinball machine creators misinterpret that like oh the final frontier we'll put that at the i've end. got to look up i've got to look this up now on the uh, wikipedia <laughs> i have a question for you do you know what countdown is called in in australia um the french show that it originated from is called they chiffre a les nombres, the letters and numbers or something. So I'm going to guess letters and numbers. Letters and numbers, correct. Which, uh, when, when I discovered they were the same show, I was very disappointed in Australia's naming ability. <laughs> it's such a literal, like, you know, count, Countdown has some theme to it. It has some stakes. It, it's evocative. And then in Australia, we're like, well, there's letters and there's numbers. So let's just call the show that. Any, any luck, Simon? No, I got nowhere. I got, I got a reference <laughs> to the quote. And then I was going to have to do some real digging. Wikipedia doesn't cover the pinball level that's you know it's disappointing outrageous talking of letters and numbers we should we should report that my translation of sudoku from the japanese was apparently false oh really yeah i can't remember how but it doesn't mean number place which i claim oh it doesn't i thought it no it's something slightly vaguer I can't. Somebody, oh. somebody did comment on one of the podcasts, but I can't remember the detail. It was something more beautiful, and then you made it very, very literal. 
like countdown. Yeah, I was going to say, you're in charge of renaming shows for the Australian market. <laughs> so someone wrote in and asked uh, for the origin of, of some of your catchphrases, such as bobbins or knowledge bomb or uh, hey nori nori, etc. <laughs> They're all Simons. I've just met a lot of strange people. <laughs> bobbins is an expression from the northwest of England where Simon claims he originated, uh, which just means nonsense or tribe or something. <laughs> but, you know, it's a kind of replacement swear word. Simon uses it effectively. Is this something that you actually say in real life, or is this something that you like do for the camera? Uh, no, I, do, I would say it in real life. No, for sure. And it, in fact, it's quite interesting thinking about northern slang. You know, I, I find myself more and more as I age, looking back on those years in the north and right, remembering. <laughs> I don't know. It was. It's a completely different lingo. Like sweets were grots. Grots. <laughs> and fights were scrap. Yeah, <laughs> fights were scraps. Whereas gr grots actually in the south, so some parts of the south, I think are your underpants, <laughs> but grots were sweets in the north of England. And that, you know, that you lived in terror when you went to school of being on the wrong side of the various school bullies that there were. And they were like, I mean, they were legion in the north of England. There were a lot more of them in north of England than there were in the south of England. And the worst thing would be if you got exposed to the goss pit. <laughs> And uh, Mark, were you one of these bullies? I've never visited the north of England for obvious reasons. <laughs> that sounds, sounds horrible. Yeah, don't, don't recommend it. Where, where are you from, Mark? Um, I'm from the Surrey London borders. I went to school in Epsom, having grown up in Sutton and Cheam, and those places will mean nothing to anyone who's not actually been there. <laughs> or watched the Derby, I suppose, which is a horse race. Although we were born in the same hospital. Yeah, yeah that's a good fact. That. It turns out that yeah. Simon's peripatetic parents were in Carl Shorten at the time he was born. And uh, that was kind of very near where I'd lived my whole life. So the only significant maternity hospital in the region is where we were both born. <laughs> That's crazy. I just had to proof a, a board game yesterday. Oh, actually, I'll quickly do a plug. This episode is sponsored by Jellybean Games, including Night of the Mummy, which is the one I was proofing yesterday. Go to jellybean.games and use the promo code BOBBINS and you'll get 10% off your order. And we do a little bio for everyone on the side of the box. And mine included the word parapet... Uh, Parapatetic? How do you say it? <laughs> Peripatetic is how I say it. Which I, I wrote, but I wrote it because of the delay between printing and actually getting the, the proofs. I wrote it months ago, so I had to go look it up and see what it meant. So it's funny to hear that word again, because I'm, I'm quite a, a parapatetic. No, <laughs> no, I tried. I thought I'd, I'd slip it in right at the end. Couldn't do it. So <laughs> when I visited England, that was the first time I really became aware of like what a what a class difference there is just socially. Like pe People are very aware of like middle class and lower class and upper class. And so this maybe is a weird question, but as someone not from England, are you two of, like, are you two of certain classes? And has that ever caused conflict in your life? Mark's landed gentry, and I would be... <laughs> I think we both straddle all the classes. But like, did you go to a, a, a private school? Is that, is that a, a thing? But I went to both. We both did, actually. So, yeah, that will immediately have us both condemned by 93% of Britons. <laughs> no, I went, I, I went to state school as a, until I was... 13 and then went to private school when when you went to a private school there yeah. so w when you guys first met was there a class divide where you looked down on and him and you looked up at him and no i certainly knew i had to doff my cap when i was in <laughs> mark's presence you saw him and you're like wait a second you're in bridget jones's diary <laughs> <laughs> because we were both accountants, we knew we were in the lowest social structure there was possible. And so the, these terms, uh, of bobbins and, and nori nori, are these these are unique to the north of England? Uh, I know nori nori is a puzzle related one. So I, th that's one where I, I found myself doing a puzzle about nine months ago, where the rules involve the, the puzzle is called nori nori. <laughs> so I had to keep saying by the rules of nori nori. Gotcha. And then. Uh, you know, I, I, by the end of the video, I think I'd said it 600 times. So that's, you know, so now if I repeat myself often, I just say nori, 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 which is a reference to that video. So that's not the north of England. <laughs> During the video, he yeah. tried to clear it from his brain by saying nori, 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 but he didn't it. It, it sounded a little bit like you're having a mental breakdown. And so I wasn't sure. It, it sounds very medieval, like, hey, nori, nori, sounds like a... Uh, a medieval dancing no it's a japanese puzzle somebody asked which were the most memorable puzzles for you guys published or unpublished so maybe stuff that like didn't even go on the channel because you solved it beforehand or or pre the channel oh that's gosh if it's pre the channel as well golly that's a very difficult question well mm. I, th I don't know if i've mentioned it in a previous 
edition of the podcast, but there are two puzzles that I've done in Galactic Puzzle Hunts that spring to mind that were utterly extraordinary and not really Sudoku related. There was a puzzle called Adventure and a puzzle, I can't remember the name of it, but it involved a word search about Canadian Prime Ministers that ended up needing Graham's number and the last 15 digits of Graham's number or something like that. It was quite... A... <laughs> You had to calculate Graham's number to solve it? Because that's... Well, you had to know what Graham's number feat. was and then work out what the last few digits were, which is also an extremely... Well, to me anyway, as somebody who's very much an amateur mathematician, it was quite incredible that you could do that. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that at all. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we may have done... I think we have done Cracking the Cryptic episodes way back in the day where we talked a bit about adventure and about the Canadian Prime Minister's puzzle. They certainly stick in my mind and... There are loads from Crossword Land as well that stick in my mind. Yeah, before the yeah. before the channel, we were both very invested in the Listener Crossword in the Times, which is where I think a lot of our most memorable puzzle moments, not together but individually, came from. So, Mark, any highlights pre Cracking the Cryptic for you? Um, again, as I say, you know, I'd, I'd remember certain crosswords. I'm not sure I remember any specific individual Sudokus in that way from before Cracking the Cryptic. I, I enjoyed always the buzz of, of competing, as we've talked about before, and kind of the, the way that if you finish a round by just finishing a puzzle in time, it's an immense adrenaline surge. So I remember that sort of thing, but no individual puzzles. Aside from maybe the obvious, any any from the channel that really have like stuck stuck with you more than, more than maybe you'd expect them to? It doesn't really work that way for me. I mean, obviously the ones that we do think are brilliant you know they find their way into books or or collections or they get mentioned occasionally but there aren't really any sort of bubbling under but then every so often you do a puzzle and you just go oh yeah yeah i've seen this sort of thing before and that does trigger them you know it's all a lot of it is sitting there in the late memory somehow just fermenting away and simon mentioned i think in the last episode that there was a Japanese sums that I really, really struggled with, but loved. I remember that one, but it's, I don't know, I don't, I don't have a kind of highlight reel in my mind that I can play back of, so don't. You see, I'm different to you in that regard. I definitely do. In many regards. Many, yeah, many, many, many regards. You'll be pleased, you'll be relieved to hear, and you always knew. But like, yeah, that, there are loads of puzzles that, you know, I think of that I've done on the channel that have like, blown my mind and in fact quick plug for the book i suppose there's a puzzle in the book by fister mafell which is i mean it's just ridiculous uh, i certainly remember doing that and i mean some of the puzzles actually bring tears to my eyes now nowadays they're just ridiculous you know you sort of suddenly you're presented with something you think how how has someone had the idea to make this and then revealed it this cleverly and it's like you you know on the channel we're lucky because we're constantly presented with just moments of genius from these setters and you know it's pretty startling do you remember jesper's puzzle mark well we, the, i've done two or three by jesper which are you talking about it's the one that had um sort of funny cross-shaped cages in the grid i can't remember what we called the video and that's the other thing peter is it's really hard because so often now we do puzzles that are quite quite incredible that I think if the world knew about them, they would go, good grief, that is incredible. But we don't know how to make the world know about them. You know, there's an audience out there for these puzzles that is massively more than we're able to reach at the moment, even though we do reach a lot of people. And I'd love to, I'd love to you know, just show, just show the world a few of these puzzles and go, yeah, this, this exists as a thing. Isn't it incredible? Go, go on countdown with a crack and cryptic shirt and then uh... <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't work i mean i it wouldn't work are we we've because we have had quite a lot of publicity over the over the years of one sort or another and there have been many moments where we thought ah this publicity will be super good for us and it does nothing at all i remember when mark did a video did you do yeah you did a video that rachel riley was really really into wasn't she yeah she had um it posted a a maths puzzle and I did a video explaining the solution and how you could get to it and, and she was very intrigued yeah Who, who's Rachel Riley sorry uh, she's the countdown numbers lady ah gotcha she is the well, one of the hostesses on countdown so the, the woman who does the maths she's an absolute genius in her own mm. right and she's but she's got something like 600 or 700,000 Twitter followers you know she tweeted all about Mark's video <laughs> and we thought wait this is it um, I think 
five more people watch the video as a result or something. Yeah, this, this is the lesson I learned from Night Crew, where I got a ridiculously stellar cast, and they all tweeted about it, and very few people listened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I, I, I can definitely yeah. sympathise with you there. So one person wrote in, saying that when when they first discovered Sudoku, they assumed that you were meant to do no pencil marks, no notations, just the final digits. And they asked if, if there was ever a time where that was, was that was a thing in Sudoku. Like, was that ever part of the of the process? Or is there a class of Sudoku tournaments where they don't allow pencil marks? I thought it was an interesting take on the whole idea. Um, it is a thing for some people. We, we had one guy who commented for the best part of a year with complaints that we were using pencil marks. And then he would put his own <laughs> order of solved cells without using them and uh, get very stressed with us. <laughs> Might be the same guy. <laughs> no, you do, you do meet a lot of people who assume that the, the puzzle, is, as you suggested, is, is kind of spoiled by pencil marking and, and, and it's cheating in a way. So it is a well-known theory, but not one we subscribe to, as you know. Maybe, maybe next time you do an approachable one, you can try that, see, see how, how quickly you can solve it with no pencil marks. <laughs> <laughs> It's sort of like people play chess completely mentally. They just like sit down across a, a blank table mm. and just say like this, this to here, this to here. It's a whole different way of thinking. Yeah, I thought that's so impressive. It's an absolute magic yeah. trick. It's incredible. Are you two into chess? Not Simon will have mastered it at some point <laughs> in the past, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> He's only a grandmaster though. So what's even the point? No, I, no, I never. What was your peak? Go on. You I... must have been top board at school or something like that. Weird. No, no, no. Oh. No, I did. I play, used to play it at school, but <laughs> with with very little distinction. Uh, I mean, I was in the school team, but uh, there was. <laughs> and we won England. But besides that, no, no, no. The guy actually who I played bridge with a lot when I was younger, and we did win the national championships with at bridge. <laughs> he was a very good chess player. I think he was nationally rated. I'm not sure how high he went, but his name was Ed Ionides. He was a very smart guy went to Trinity College, Cambridge to read maths and then I think became a maths professor uh, in the US. But yeah, he was the school star when it came to chess. And I never devoted the time necessary to learn learn the openings properly. And it always seemed, you know, beyond me to to properly master the, the, the openings. Whereas the, you know, the people who are really good at chess are not only superb calculators, but they have an incredible memory. It's a very strange memory where they can literally remember you know games from 50 years ago when this particular move was played and that's a memory i don't have definitely not except he does for sudoku and he <laughs> still follows chess as well i do follow chess i'm very interested in chess so simon will get very stressed yeah. with me if i don't know what magnus carlson <laughs> or fabiano caruana yeah. has done lately did you know what your elo is uh, simon no i never i never never did uh mark you, you're not, not a chess person uh, I know the rules, you know, if, if you selected eight random people and put them in a room, I'd probably be the best player, but, uh, but uh, if you selected eight chess players and put them in a room, I'd be the worst. It's, it's, a, it's interesting, for, for, in my mind, for some reason, there's overlap between Sudoku and chess, and now that I'm thinking about it, there's not really, I guess they're both kind of logical-ish? There, there, there's certainly an element of if this, then, then that, isn't there, about chess? Uh, and Sudoku. Yeah. I think they're the two disciplines in which looking a number of moves ahead is, is an understood discipline. <laughs> a approved in some cases and disapproved in others. <laughs> <laughs> if you do it in real life, you can't realistically look more than two ahead. But in chess and Sudoku, you can look a bit further ahead and then somebody calls it bifurcation. <laughs> Yeah, don't, don't bifurcate your chess game. People get mad at you. <laughs> that would be hilarious, wouldn't it? That would be just <laughs> hilarious if, if they accused Magnus Carlsen of bifurcation <laughs> on the basis that he... <laughs> that he was looking too far ahead in his mind. Simon, you just put up on, on Patreon a StarCraft video, which I really enjoyed watching, and you compared StarCraft to chess, which I thought was an interesting comparison. Hmm. Yes, I th well, I don't think that's. My I've heard that description of StarCraft before. It's, StarCraft is an incredible game with a lot more volatility, I suppose, than chess because the pieces in StarCraft can move in an infinite number of ways rather than just in a set number of ways. Uh, but it's an extremely strategic game as well as being, as relying on mechanics, i.e., how quickly your hands can move and how quickly your eyes can move so yeah it's a i got absolutely obsessed with it about uh eight years ago like i mean ridiculously obsessed with it i would watch so many like more than pinball 
um, actually, well, actually similar, you know, in the sense that it dominated my life for many, many years. Um, you know, I would, I would play it for four hours a day at the same time as trying to hold down a job in the city of London. I'd watch it for another two hours a day. And, you know, I'd find myself going to bed at three or four in the morning, having to get up <laughs> two hours later to go to work, you know. And, yeah, it was, it was, I had, to, it was a good thing, actually, when I managed to kick, I can't remember how I managed to kick the habit, but I did. And that's a relief. I sort of got my life back a bit. So It's, uh, it, it's <laughs> funny the things we get obsessed with, because this, this is why we're all here today, because you two got obsessed with sudoku i would i would i would posit <laughs> i think a reasonable uh, supposition um and then similarly i got obsessed with your channel and just watched hours and hours and hours and hours of your channel so it's a it's a funny rabbit hole uh mark have you have you had any of these obsessions uh, beyond sudoku mm. and cheating on your wife i mean too many i think the thing with simon and myself is we both fit in ludicrous amounts and extents of obsessions into our lives and as he says you sometimes have to kind of kick the addiction so yeah you know, I, I guess for a, a long period of my life, I was very much obsessed with crosswords. For another possibly overlapping period, I was obsessed with playing a very low level of cricket. <laughs> uh, you know, there's the TV shows that one's binged and, uh, or, or like Simon says, you know, you have to see every episode. They would count as obsessions. They're just constant. They happen all the time. Impossible to avoid them. Cricket's a funny one because playing cricket is very dependent on like other people in a physical space. You can't you can't pop online at three a.m. and play some cricket. Yeah, I think that was my savior from being lost in a complete world of the mind early on. Was that I was I was involved in an actually <laughs> semi-athletic team game, so it was quite useful for me. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, uh, it's interesting. Sorry, I'm, I don't have a point there. I'm just I'm just thinking about obsession. <laughs> <laughs> so someone wrote in and. Uh, you probably you probably get this one in the comments all the time, but I am a little bit curious myself. Why don't you use the keyboard shortcuts? The uh, the solver you use has really excellent keyboard shortcuts, and instead you guys kind of manually click through all, click through it all. I didn't know that. Well, I didn't know that work keyboard. I know Control A highlights the whole grid, but I you know I don't use the number pad or anything. I am com a complete luddite. You don't use the number pad? No, I don't. What? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. He's he's using the numbers at the top of the screen. I, That's I had why no Simon idea. will often hit the wrong one. Yeah. Well, also because I can't actually see my keyboard when I'm. Um... <laughs> He, well, yes, he can't see his keyboard because he's got his setup so that his microphone blocks it. So I can't see the keyboard, and yeah, I use I use the top row. And he's using the wrong bit of it. So it's a it's a brilliantly professional organized organization. <laughs> it's a train wreck. <laughs> I guess the the question about using the shortcuts though, you 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 do what you get used to, and everybody just does that more. Like if there was a period when we used different pencil mark styles and the ones Simon would put in the corner, I was putting in the middle. The ones he would put in the middle, I was putting in the corner. And of course, quite logically, the viewers got infuriated by this. Oh, really? At which point oh, one of us, and of course it was me, had to learn the other person's system yeah. and actually implement it. And, <laughs> you know, there was, a, there was a period of weeks where I was recording videos daily and really struggling with the pencil mark system I was using. But you get over that hump in the end, and you know. Again, if I yeah, if you're doing it daily for a few hours, if I now trained myself to to find what what all the shortcut keys. I mean, if it means kind of control and spacebar, well, I do use some of them. But I just you know sometimes it's quicker to click on the on the icon. What, or something. what does control spacebar do? <laughs> well, control four is puts in a, a a pencil mark in the middle of the cell. Spacebar four, I think, puts it in the corner. I, I'm on Mac, so I can't, I can't speak. But I think, I think it's Alt Shift and uh, Control do colors, middle and corner. Oh, I see. Yeah, I've never used Alt for the colors, which which probably does exist. I didn't even know it was there. It's like like meeting a, a Formula One driver, and they're like, "What? What do you mean? There's multiple gears? In the, what? I just I just hit the accelerator, and it goes fast forward, and you're like, oh, oh, what are you?" <laughs> So we got a question, uh, what's the thought process behind covering multiple puzzles in a single video versus doing an easier puzzle as a standalone video? And this is something I think Mark does more often than Simon. Yeah, I mean, there's an extent to which I think if I was to do one easy puzzle in a seven minute video, I, I feel it's cheating the audience a little bit. 
I can't really see that they're going to get much out of it. If I'm going to do easy puzzles, therefore, I'll do three or five in a go. Um, and then they've got something to watch as I try and speed run them or as we go through different things. And if they only want to try one themselves, that's fine. They can just click on one link and try that and watch my solve of that one. But I can't, you know, it just feels like we, we do get comments if we do. If I've occasionally done an 11 or 12 minute video lately and uh, people do feel like, whoa, whoa, was that it? Like, yeah, that was it. <laughs> A little cheated, yeah. And you're like, look, I'm getting older. I can't always last as long as I was. Wow, so. that, that's just coming desperately <laughs> fast. <laughs> <laughs> Someone asked, I thought this was a very cute question, have the two of you ever lived together or considered living together? <laughs> the answer is no, and the implication is beyond terrifying. <laughs> I was going to say, it feels, it feels like a very odd couple situation. It would be a very odd couple. Mark can cook, so it would probably be okay for me. I, I imagine Mark is very, very <laughs> neat and clean, and Simon is just... Uh, stewing stuff all over the house is that is that accurate no 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 you've got that i'd say you've got that entirely oh, really? wrong although actually uh, simon's the more obsessive personality so he's more likely to have ocd and be clean on the other hand i have seen the room in which he films and and i've completely contradicted myself <laughs> it's it's a big stuff <laughs> Simon, do you have a defense here? Not really. I don't keep a very clean <laughs> desk, to be honest. Um, I'm not very tidy at all. And I'm very, very, very bad at all sorts of household-related activities. Like, you know, I just, I just don't see mess at all. It just doesn't register with me. So I, you know, if it was left to me, I would just live in squalor well, you, have, you have kids now so that's basically the same thing I, it's good because i can blame them so <laughs> uh, yeah but it's nonsense because i'm instinctively the same as simon but i have at least learned a few behaviors to try and, <laughs> try and deal with that when you two met were you single or were you already with your similarly named wives at that point we, we both had partners called anna at the time but they weren't the same person you've tried that on us before <laughs> <laughs> Is, is this the are you two married to Anna's now or is this different people I am he's not I I used to be married to Anna and then then I'm not married anymore to, to Anna <laughs> I was say, you, you, you are married in general now though right yes I am married in general to a, to a, a different lady who's not called Anna she's not called Anna <laughs> no matter how hard you try to make her she's like no I'm, I'm not gonna what 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 do wives do what uh, if, if they're okay with being talked about on a podcast what are their lives like well mine's incredibly amazing uh, mine works in the city <laughs> and she sits at her desk all day long and uh and just works away what, what, what does she do sorry you got cut off she works for a fund manager so she's in, in accounting as well mm, she she is a qualified accountant but that's not the day job she sort of she's called a business manager couldn't describe exactly what that role is to you. Do you guys have friends who aren't accountants? Is that a, a thing you've ever considered? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know many accountants actually, oh, really? apart, from, <laughs> apart from my wife and my business partner. <laughs> one person asked, and this is a bit of a controversial one, have you ever, and obviously don't name the puzzle, have you ever solved a puzzle, completed the video, and then been like, not going up, and just recorded a new one? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Is that common? Yes. I mean, that's common because if it wasn't, the quality of the channel wouldn't be as good as we try and keep it. Yeah. yeah. That, that is commonplace. Does it often have more to do with the puzzle or the solve? No, it's the puzzle normally, actually. It's more often the puzzle, but certainly for me, sometimes the solve. If I've ever done a, what I think is a terrible solve of a decent puzzle, I feel the constructor would be as offended as he would be pleased to see the puzzle. <laughs> so, so I feel just, and I, I feel that most of the viewers would be disgusted. So I won't post that. But normally it's the puzzle. So in the past, we've talked a little bit about sort of how you yeah. met. And that, that was through, let me, let me see if I remember correctly. That was through Simon reaching out to Mark and saying like, Te teach me your ways, O, o Jedi Master. Correct. Sensei. Yeah, yeah, Sensei. And then how, how quickly from there did it turn into like a, a friendship? Like from, from there, when did you go from like, oh yeah, we, I met this random guy off the internet to like best man at the wedding? Um, I think reasonably, I can't remember. This is 20 years ago. But I think it wasn't that... So I think we agreed to meet for lunch or something. And the thing is about us, we have so much in common. And there isn't... In real life, you don't meet very many people who have our hobbies. 
So when you do meet somebody who has your hobby, who is also not... <laughs> the hobbies being Sudoku, crossword, dating people called Anna. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any sort, you know, any sort of, you know, puzzle-related stuff. Or I mean, we're both very into sport as well. But, like, I mean, that's, that's more normal. I think it's also, in terms of people who are as obsessed as we are with those things, we're not incapable of having lunch together and talking about it. You know, whereas, you know, sometimes or some of the people I've met, I'm thinking more about bridge now in my past. You know, when I played bridge for Cambridge, you know, some of the people I was playing with there, you know, they you couldn't have gone out for lunch with them. It would have been impossible because, you know, they wouldn't have said anything. They would have just sat in their anorak sort of staring into space, looking slightly mad. Um, (laughs) And while Mark is prone to doing that, it's less frequent. Yeah, we do, I think, as well as share the same interests, we do share the same outlook on those interests as well. So, and, and that's a slightly unusual thing. I mean, I think there was... Can, can you dive into that? What, what do you mean by that? Um, I mean, I think that we can be very much into what we're doing and obsessed by it, but at the same time realise that we look a bit odd to a random person doing that. <laughs> and then either not care or, you know, accept that and... and um, work out a way to deal with it together. So I don't know. We, yeah, we we have very similar outlooks. I mean, I'm sure there was a period when Simon was very frustrated that it turned out I didn't have secrets I could pass on for crossword solving. But uh, <laughs> he got over that quickly. Yeah, I mean, it's true as well that we do have similar views of. There's a poem by uh, Brian Bilston called "Refugees," which is. Um, I've talked about it on the channel. I may even have read it on the channel at one point or other. It's an incredible poem where if you read it forwards, it means one thing. And if you read it backwards, it, re- it means the complete opposite. And I, when I first came across this poem, I was utterly, utterly staggered by it. And I men- I've mentioned it to a few friends, some of whom, although they're very crosswordy, just think oh well yeah that's not that difficult you know (laughs) doesn't mean anything whereas mark i think had a similar reaction to me about it which was one of absolute astonishment that this could be possible yeah i I was in awe of the puzzle i constructed a a crossword about it for the magpie magazine as a result to introduce it to other people and then found that all of my fellow editors were yeah not really you know it's not that clever anybody could do it once you see how it's done and uninterested and it was just it was horrific it was like that's so weird and yet you know simon understood how clever it was that's wonderful and i did and you do feel a bit isolated sometimes when you have the same reaction and not everybody in the room does oh no (laughs) (laughs) yeah there's there's a quote i've always liked which is i like hamburgers more knowing that you also like hamburgers yeah (laughs) so like when when you find someone who's into the same thing as you that it, it not only like is, is good for bonding with that person, it makes you enjoy the thing more because you, you have someone to share it with. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Although it's quite amusing how often Simon will say, will assume that I have the same <laughs> feelings as him about other things and <laughs> will... Ch- chess and Starcraft? Uh, no, he doesn't expect that. But he does expect that I will understand what is, and I say in his opinion, but he believes objectively very good music or something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he won't yeah. he won't understand that somebody else could not like some bit of music <laughs> that he likes. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, kid, kids are like that. I have a friend who's got a little eleven year old who's obsessed with Transformers, and I had to sit down and be like, <laughs> "Please stop telling me about Transformers." Like because it, it, I was staying with him for two weeks and after three days I, like every conversation four hours a day I, 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 I tend to be pretty tolerant and not burn out on stuff but I got to the point where I was like you need to stop telling me and he I mean he, he was a kid so how did your friend's parent react to you telling the kid that uh, p- people people who invite me to stay sort of know what they're getting I think <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they, they were similarly frustrated because they were like yeah we've been living with this for six months I, I, I used kid language I said um, you are not being a very good friend by telling me about about Transformers I want I want to be a good friend and the kid poor kid couldn't get it like just because you know they're a kid just was like no but I but I love Transformers <laughs> You, you and me, like, they, they hadn't connected that, you know. It, it's, it's a thing when a kid is... Uh... Yeah, well, when you meet a kid who is 47 or 48, that's Simon. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, okay, so last question uh, that I wanted to ask was, where do you see the channel in like 10 years? What, what are you looking forward to coming up? What, what are your plans for it? Golly, that's... There is nowhere where we see the channel in 10 years. We maybe look <laughs> two or three months ahead at any time. You, you going to wind it down? No. Um, I, don't, I don't think we have <laughs> grandiose plans for world domination or anything like that, but we would like to keep spreading the gospel, basically. Yeah. I, I think that's right. I think something that we will look into a little bit anyway is streaming. But whether we stream Sudoku or not, I'm not sure. We might stream puzzle games or something, or I might at least have a go at that. I'm not sure anyone would want to see it, but that is something we're thinking about. Uh, Mark, you're, you're not a video gamer, are you? I think I've asked you this before. Um, it's, you know, I've got occasionally obsessed by Candy Crush for a few weeks or something. <laughs> It barely counts as being a video game. It's basically Sudoku. It's, a, <laughs> it's just stuff in a grid, except you try, you try to repeat in the row and column instead of the opposite. <laughs> no, I don't think I, I play any serious video games in the way that, that somebody would call themselves a game. So uh, I want to end this final episode of the first season with something I've been obsessed with. And I floated the idea of doing a whole episode about this. And Mark was like, that sounds interesting. And Simon said, no, no, let's not do that. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm dipping it into the end, which is, I have been completely obsessed lately with the actual process by which people think. And this is something that's partially come about from watching your channel, actually. Uh, <laughs> you two do solve puzzles in different ways, and we've kind of touched on this in, in earlier episodes. So have, have either of you heard of the term aphantasia? No. no. So aphantasia, it's a relatively new term. It's from the last five years. And like I said, this, this, is, this is just now me going off on a thing I'm obsessed with. Um, uh, aphantasia is the inability to see things in the mind's eye. And it's an interesting term because people often respond in one of two ways of like, wow, there are people who can't see stuff in their mind's eye or wait, are you telling me people can actually see things in their mind's eye? And so like, like everything, it's a spectrum. And so I'm, I'm somewhere on the aphantasia end where when I heard people talk about, you know, seeing something in their mind's eye, I thought it was a metaphor. I thought it was like, yes, obviously, you know, the idea of seeing something would be nice, but we can't do that as humans. That's, that's not a skill that we have. So I'm going to do a little exercise with you. Okay. I'm going to get you to close your eyes. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to get you to picture a dog. So imagine this dog in as much detail as you can. And now, without without changing this image, I want you to answer a few questions for me. So we'll do Simon then Mark. Uh, so what breed is this dog? A Labrador, black Labrador. Uh, Mine's a red setter. Okay. And then uh, what what is in the background? Like wh- where is the dog? Um, it's in my old house. I haven't imagined the background. <laughs> Okay, cool. So, so we can open our eyes. That, that, that's enough of the exercise. Uh, you, you can go into as many details as you like, but it's, it's interesting because for me, until I get asked that question, there is no answer. So if, if you ask me to imagine a dog, I'm like, oh, yes, the concept of a dog, of course. Yes, the idea of a dog. And then if you say what type, I have to be like, well, it's just a just, just dog, like just the essence of dog. And then I have to imagine this thing. <laughs> and so on, on, on the scale, uh, Mark is probably very slightly more on the aphantasia end because you didn't imagine a background. Whereas uh, Simon imagined a whole background. And so the more, the more I talk to people about this, as you can see, this is really an obsession of mine, the more I realize that there is many different ways to think about stuff as there are people. Like everyone has a unique way of thinking. And, you know, Descartes, we think therefore we are. Like, I think therefore I am. That's like the essence of who we are. I mean, no one's talking about this. This is why I'm so obsessed with it. So <laughs> uh, I, I emailed you this a little bit ahead of time in the hope that you'd, you'd maybe think about it. Like, do, do you, are you able to describe or do you know like how you think? I don't know how I think, but I can totally sympathize with the sort of thing you're talking about. I mean, there where you said, what is in the background? Well, I could immediately start painting in a background, but the reality was I hadn't thought of one at the stage you were talking about. Right. And I remember when I was studying English at school, there was a, a sentence in a book mentioned an example sentence saying there were a belt of villages around the base of the mountain. And it said, when you read that, everybody, of course, pictures a belt in some way in their brain. <laughs> And I read this and went, who's picturing a belt? Like, I did not at all consider a real belt. I thought, they do. I thought of the, you know, the way the villages were structured around the mountain. And at no stage did I think of the word belt, meaning a clothing mm, that's belt. That's what I did as well. And it was astonishing to me that not only that the writer had thought that, but had assumed that everybody thought that. And I think that's exactly where you're coming from. There. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, accidentally ties back to my 11-year-old friend. It's like, we, we assume hmm. 
what we think is how everyone thinks and we don't even think to question that but the strange way i think is um about words as collections of letters so almost any word i can visualize the word written in my head but conjuring up the meaning for it is is something that comes not necessarily after that it may be simultaneous but it's it's not as consistent conjuring up a meaning for a word as thinking of the word and, and when, when you think of this word like is it is it an image like is, is it like is there a font is it no it's not it's not in a particular font or, or capitals or not or anything it's just just the concept of each letter all lined up the the not the yeah, the the concept of each letter and, and as i may have explained before i have a very peculiar memory facility where i'm terrible with faces i'm not brilliant with names but i will always remember the length of someone's name <laughs> how many letters they have in their name that's amazing and that's a very you know that's a very very peculiar thing and obviously i have learned that nobody else has that or does yeah. it or things like that or would no, but, and even i think i'm a bit mad my, my, my similar thing is that I, I i think of when i hear a name i think of how it's spelled so i have a friend called Faye, f-e-d-j-e Faye. and i was at, I was at a party with my friend Faye on the fourth of july and someone said where's Faye?" but when they said where's Faye?" i was like where's f-a-y-a and my response was like who who on earth is Faye?" like why would I know who this like random person you mentioned? And then a second later, I was like, "Oh, my friend who I came here with." Yes, I do know, I do know where they are. So similarly, if I meet like a Jane with a Y versus a Jane without a Y, they're two completely different people for me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I share that, and and I will always remember for the rest of my life how your friend Fayer is spelled. <laughs> yeah, right, Fed J. <laughs> the, uh, the the other one is uh, the the arrangement of consonants and vowels. So for me, Rebecca and Danielle are very similar names because they both go consonant, vowel, consonant, and then one or two vowels and then consonant, consonant, vowel. And so many times in my life, I've gotten Rebecca and Danielle. So like Beck and Dan, I guess, would be the, the shorter version, confused because they're roughly the same name to me. Yeah, that I have a similar thing. Uh, there's a lady I know called Adrienne who I called Danielle a couple of times. It's eight letters. It ends in yeah. E repeated consonant <laughs> e, it's virtually the same but it's yeah. nothing like the same to anyone else <laughs> simon do you have any of these no <laughs> actually i really don't um i mean i have spent hours and hours trying to understand how some of the great solvers think you know where is their advantage coming from is it is it that they can read more quickly than me or is it that they can you know multiply eight by seven quicker than I can well what is it what actually is it that they're able to do um you normally come up with the answer well actually it's everything so it, it becomes less <laughs> Simon's interest in that is quite interesting though because he believes and I think possibly quite rightly that if he could just master the particular skills and know what to focus on he would be that good as as the best Whereas the rest of us are quite happy to assume that Kota Morinishi and Teeth Bunk are always going to be better than us. Simon is actually trying to hone his idea of their thinking into something he can develop for himself. And that, that is the way to succeed. Well, yes. Oh, yeah. See, I, I, I come at it from the other angle. I, I'm sort of like the way that you think is to a certain extent, like always going to be more natural than trying to force yourself to think other ways. So find the things that line up with that skill like th that line up with your way of thinking and so it, it's sort of the same idea but from the opposite end sorry Simon what are you saying no I, I I think I think Mark's right in in terms of my goal was always to to understand and therefore improve competitively by learning acquiring their knowledge if you like and um you know synthesizing it and becoming uh, <laughs> a more powerful superhero <laughs> but in the end you realize that actually it's just the way they're made they're they're just they're just more efficient human beings in that particular field and i do i have some sympathy for your view as well peter about because i you know if i relate this to golf for example <laughs> as as we do with all things <laughs> yeah but go, everyone has their own golf swing and to actually change it and make it tangibly better so that it lasts forever and you know is always better than you, what you instinctively do is very 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 difficult some might say almost impossible 
So it's almost like we all have this DNA which gives us something. It gives us a set of tools and perhaps it would be better to just sort of say, well, I've got this. This is my, this is my bag of tools. What does that be best fit with? But I hate that idea because it sort of suggests that we're all, you know, inherently limited and I don't that instinct that instinctively annoys me so yeah yeah I don't think so much about being limited so good let me explain about my bag of tools there because when um, when I'd known Simon for about 10 years and we played golf occasionally during that time I said to him being an expert on golf swings what did you think of my swing when you first saw it he won't remember the answer, but he said, I knew you'd never be lost. And he does, you know, he has no idea what a crushing blow that was. <laughs> <laughs> Just casually offhanded, destroyed your, your dreams. Oh, yeah. Well, no, that was his, you know, he thought about it quite hard and then said that. And it's probably the politest thing he could say which is just painful. So we, we will, I, I could talk about this for hours and, uh, and, and probably will in the future, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll end that there. It's just an interesting way of, of thinking about thinking. Uh, any, any closing thoughts for the final episode of the, of the first season of the Cracking the Cryptic podcast? Chatting the Cryptic, as people in the comments keep reminding us that it should be called. <laughs> no, if you're still with us now, thank you so much. I hope we haven't bored you too much. Um, if you're still with us now, what is wrong? <laughs> we're, we're definitely we do, we do we do enjoy it i mean that's the thing i've actually found is that these chats are very enjoyable to do so if people like listening to yeah. them that's grand well and more than that they're, they're not just quite interesting for us they actually give us food for thought that contributes oh, to the lovely. videos and things. so yeah. it really is quite useful well if if you've enjoyed them as much as we have uh, let us know in the comments and we'll we'll try to bring a second season back at some point that is all thanks so much for listening you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash cracking the cryptic or by visiting jellybean.games and using the promo code BOBBINS to get 20% off. Any, or 20%, I said 10% earlier. I've, I've uh, misremembered my own promo code. <laughs> uh, any of our gorgeous, colourful, delightful games for the whole family. I would recommend the Masquerade series, which is Dracula's Feast, and coming out very soon, the one I, I mentioned earlier, Night of the Mummy, uh, which is a logical deduction game for 4-8 to eight players, so it's sort of like multiplayer competitive Sudoku with horror characters. So if, if that appeals, definitely check out Dracula's Feast, New Blood, and coming soon, Night of the Mummy. Leave us a comment or email podcast at crackingthecryptic.com, begging us to come back, and uh, that'll, that'll help us uh, work out when to the next season. Thank you so much for listening. I uh, hope you've enjoyed. It's been an absolute delight to talk to you two, and I very much hope that we do a second season soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye.